All right, hello everyone. Good afternoon and thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you made your way to this webinar and are not familiar with the Preservation League, um, we are a New York statewide nonprofit that focuses on investing in people and projects that champion historic preservation. Um, we do this lots of different ways and we do our work all over New York State. Um, we offer technical services, we manage uh, grant programs, including our signature Preserve New York and Technical Assistance Grants, which is a partnership from uh, between the League and NISCA. And our TAG grants are open right now. So if you're looking for um, grant money, uh, we have our Seven to Save program of endangered sites around the state, our public policy and advocacy program that we do at the federal, state and local levels, our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards, which honors people, publications, and projects and organizations that exemplify best practices in preservation, and a variety of online programming, including resilience and disaster planning, uh, historic tax credits, um, open office hours, and programs like this. Um, and so today we're really excited to be talking about uh, workforce development and preservation. This uh, webinar is part of our Future of Preservation webinar series, which has been generously sponsored by the Peggy Ann and Roger G. Gary Charitable Trust, so thank you to them. Um, this is the last of that series that is currently on the schedule, so thank you for tuning in and um, for tuning in all through this year for all of the, the great conversations that we've been able to host. Um, as we were putting this program together, you know, we were thinking about topics that are important to preservation now, but are also important to the future of preservation. So workforce development is absolutely part of that conversation. Um, the skills that are necessary to take care of historic buildings, homes, uh, cemeteries is uh, quite specialized. And so making sure that the next generation has those skills um, is extremely important to the preservation field and to our shared cultural heritage and our built environment. So we wanted to gather some people who are doing really great work in that vein, who are managing really successful workforce development programs within the preservation field to kind of talk about their experience, their best practices, and um, kind of have a group discussion about, you know, how we move this forward, how we, how we um, you know, help this aspect of preservation really thrive into the future. And so um, we're gonna be joined today by several panelists. Uh, we're really excited to welcome Natalie Henshaw, who is the Historic Trades Program Manager at Preservation Maryland. Um, Preservation Maryland's Campaign for Historic Trades is a partnership between Preservation Maryland and the National Park Service. So she's gonna be talking about their work. Um, she'll be followed by Milan Jordan, who is the Hope Crew Director at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And they are really focused on offering hands-on experience to that next generation of uh, preservation trades people. She'll be followed by Laura Lepping, who's the Vice Chair of the Northern Bedrock Historic Preservation Corps, who are doing great work out in Minnesota. Um, in her professional life, um, Laura also focuses on um, uh, providing disability justice uh, to many fields, including cultural heritage. Um, she'll be followed by Anne Cust, who's the Regional Director of North America at the World Monuments Fund. Uh, Anne just started at WMF this year, um, and she's gonna be talking specifically about their Bridge to Crafts career program that they've been doing collaboratively with Woodlawn and Greenwood Cemeteries for the last several years. So we're really excited to have Anne to give that um, kind of more local New York perspective. Um, and then, after Anne speaks, they will all be joined by Daniel McEnany, who is the Community Engagement Unit Coordinator at the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, the Division of Historic Preservation. And um, Daniel does many things at uh, SHPO, um, including overseeing programs like the Historical Motor Tax Credit and um, Certified Local Government Program. So we're excited to have him kind of guide that conversation. Um, if during anyone's speaking, uh, you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, Daniel will make sure to get to as many audience questions as possible during that group discussion. Um, if you have general comments, the chat will be open. I'll be monitoring the chat. So if anybody mentions anything that I can quickly drop a link to, I will do so there. Um, and just to make sure that everyone knows this uh, webinar is being recorded. So um, you will be able to find it on our Facebook, on our YouTube. Um, so if you can't stay for the whole thing, you'll be able to find it. If you love it so much that you want to share it with all your friends, you'll be able to do that too. Um, and yeah, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Natalie. Howdy. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, so hello, and thank you for 
allowing me on this webinar. My name is Natalie Henshaw and I am the Campaign for Historic Trades Program Manager. The Campaign for Historic Trades is a workforce development program to broaden and develop careers in the historic trades. It's made possible through a partnership between Preservation Maryland and the National Park Service. Okay. So I'm going to provide some background information on uh, preservation workforce development in general. It's the foundation for what everybody is going to be talking about today, so it's important to establish. A very good starting point is the off-referenced White Hill Report. Um, this is an excerpt from the report, and it summarizes the major problems facing the historic trades. So. 40 years ago, most architects had been trained in the grammar of historic styles and in draftsmanship, while many older carpenters and masons were still familiar with the traditional techniques of their crafts. Through changes in the curricula of architectural schools beginning in the 1930s, only an occasional architect of the present day has an interest in and knowledge of the past trades, inspired by new Oh, that were once commonplace the profession, pardon me. <laughs> With rapidly changing techniques in the building trades, inspired by new materials and prefabrication, the ability to repair or, where necessary, reproduce details in old buildings has become extremely uncommon. The larger public and private organizations engaged in historic preservation, of which the National Park Service and Colonial Williamsburg are conspicuous examples, have been forced to train and develop their own staffs of archaeologists, research historians, architects, and craftspeople. As these specialists are normally fully occupied with the work of their own organizations, the number of professional restorationists available for general work is very small indeed. The pressing need to increase their number is the main problem to which this committee has addressed itself. So this describes our situation today, but the White Hill Report was published by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 1968. <laughs> Everyone on this panel is still grappling with this problem half a century later, and why? <laughs> there is no single answer reason, but a fundamental issue is that the historic trades are not an occupation. So allow me to explain what I mean by that. An occupation can be defined as the principal activity one engages in to earn money. The United States has ONET. It stands for the Occupation Information Network. It's a list of registered jobs and their descriptions. You can find carpenter on this list, but you cannot find preservation carpenter. As such, official labor data demonstrates that preservation carpenters don't exist in the United States. We all know that's not true, but in official capacities like insurance and tax classifications, it's the working truth. So problem number one, we aren't even a recognized occupation. Problem number two, we can't be a profession without being an occupation first. So an article by Lon Ferguson and James Ramsey titled Development of a Profession defines a profession as an occupation requiring special knowledge or skill. A preservation carpenter is clearly both an occupation and a profession, but, or it qualifies as such, but they specify that to actually become a profession, there are four standards to meet. Um, and those four standards are one, establish a set of widely acceptable professional qualifications. This is usually done through an accrediting organization with the universal standards imposed on anybody seeking professional certification. Two, establish barriers to entry. This doesn't mean automatically excluding people, but rather a method of discerning qualified pr practitioners from unqualified practitioners. Three, establish professional associations. Besides socialization and networking, these associations create and regulate continuing education and lobby for specific policies or legislation that affect the practice of profession. And four, establish and enforce professional code of ethics. If you take any recognizable profession, medical doctors, archeologists, architects, engineers, teachers, they all follow these four steps to professionalism. So the preservation dilemma. As I stated previous, oh, pardon me. <laughs> what does it mean for preservation? Historic trades are an undefined occupations. 
that encompass multiple specialty trades. We lack professional qualification standards, we have siloed training efforts, and we do not have systematic connections between trainees, employers, educators, and trainers. As a workforce development program, an apt metaphor is living in a derelict house while you restore it. <laughs> Everyone presenting today is tackling these issues, and we have a few projects ongoing at the campaign to address them. As I stated previously, the campaign is a partner program between Preservation Maryland and the National Park Service. Preservation Maryland was founded in 1931, 80 years ago, or 90 years ago, pardon me. <laughs> To protect the best of Maryland, today we have 13 employees with the national impact. The campaign is an example of that. We work on a national scale, not just in the state of Maryland. On this slide, you see a photo of the Maryland State Capitol building, and then also a photo of early members of Preservation Maryland unveiling a historic marker. Preservation Maryland is a natural partner with the MPS due to the location of the Historic Preservation Training Center in Frederick, Maryland. The Historic Preservation Training Center was founded in 1971 as a result of the Whitehall Report. They were inspired to do something as an action item from that. The HPTC, as it's called, trains na uh, National Park Service employees and trains craftspeople to preserve historic resources and promote historic preservation. These photos show the headquarters for the Historic Preservation Training Center in Frederick, Maryland, as well as an MPS and trainee replacing wooding siding on a historic site. The goals of this partnership, there are a lot of things that we're doing, but three primary ones are registering a nat uh, national apprenticeships in historic trades, supporting and recruiting for the NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, referred to as TTAP, and compiling open source curriculum and a library of trades training resources on accessible learning platforms. And then this photo, there are two NPS workers stabilizing a stone building together. I'll first talk about the apprenticeship side of this. Why apprenticeships? <laughs> Fundamentally, trades were learned in this manner, working on the job alongside one or more expert tradespeople. Apprenticeships also expand access to training and provide educational equity. By establishing a national apprenticeship, apprentices don't necessarily need to relocate to a trade school to learn. They can find a nearby expert to work and learn with. We're coordinating the apprentices' education with these college classes so apprentices can remain in relevant jobs and earn degrees simultaneously. They don't have to choose their job or learning or college. If we can do it both, people won't have to give up their college to go and work if they need to, or people who need to work can also attend college. It won't be exclusive. Another reason is to create cohesive national training and occupational standards. Once we register an apprenticeship, it creates an occupational code in ONET, what I referenced earlier, the occupation network, um, information network, pardon me, complete with training and occupational standards. So that helps resolve that big issue of we're not even an occupation. Once we register the apprenticeship, we become an official occupation. So these two points address historic trade specifically, but apprenticeships overall have been shown to benefit employees and employers. It sets expectations for both entities with oversight of a third party. In this case, it would be the campaign. You actually sign an agreement between all three parties. And in that agreement, the apprenticeship agreement, it outlines what an apprentice should learn and what they should be able to do. So what the apprentice gets and what the employer gets and sets wage increases accordingly. This improves employee satisfaction retention in part because the employer demonstrates their commitment to the employee's professional development. And in this photo, you can see a timber framing expert. He's overseeing the raising of a timber frame truss. This was a replica truss from Notre Dame Cathedral. And, and this whole workshop, there were about 20 expert timber framers leading the reconstruction with 20 students, a one-to-one -one ratio. That's usually the expert to apprenticeship ratio. You don't have 
um, what you usually see in classrooms where it's 40 students to one teacher. It's a one-on-one -on -one learning experience or sometimes even five experts to one student. Our next major push is to help support and recruit for the National Park Service Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program. In this program, the HPTC, Historic Preservation Training Center, coordinates with parks across the country to train people in preservation practices. It focuses on young adults up to age 30 and veterans up to age 35. TTAP members work in parks across the country training one-on-one -on -one with park leads in different trades, such as carpentry, masonry, roofing, finishing and painting, and window restoration. Not excluding anything else, but those are the main focuses. These terms usually last five to six months and participants really receive hourly wages, educational award, as well as non-competitive hiring status for the MPS upon completion. It's a very good pathway to permanent federal employment. There's also broad support in the government for this program. It's expected to quadruple in size by 2023. The internal goal is placing a TTAP trainee in every national park across the country, which is 423 different sites. Um, right now we place about 100 per year. So the goal is by 2023, there's almost 400. It's going to be very big. <laughs> So we still face a major question on the quest to professionalism. How do you define and distinguish historic trades from modern trades? How do you create universal standards for vastly different skill sets? We want to coordinate with existing programs like the International Masonry Institute and the Association of Builders and Contractors to both include and standardize preservation training across different industries. One method to achieve this is through the open source curriculum that I mentioned earlier and the resource library. Our goals on all of these initiatives, we want to draw these lines back to these points. We want to ensure responsible stewardship of historic resources, promote the preservation of quality craftsmanship and professionalism through structured and standardized training. We want to provide secure employment pathways for the apprentices. And we want to align standards with existing programs and articulate reciprocity between them. And in this photo, there's two TTAP members up on top of some scaffolding and their silhouettes. Those are our major goals of the campaign, but we have a lot of subsidiary and supporting activities as well. Those include, but aren't limited to, advocacy to support training programs. We're trying to create toolboxes, toolkits, so other people can try and find um, financial public support for these programs. We want to create a public directory of tradespeople and businesses. We're going to host a training calendar and map on our website. And we want to assist program creation and development, as well as provide career guidance and support to people looking to enter the trades. And in this photo, we have a TTAP member purging a stone wall at the San Juan National Historic Site. So if anybody has further questions about it, they can email me directly at nhenshaw at historictrades.org or visit our website, historictrades.org. We're going to be continually updating it and things will be changing. Um, but that is it from my end of the presentation. Look forward to any questions. And I will pass it off to Milan Jordan with the HOPE crew with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. That was really great. Let me share my screen with you all. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you here today to tell you about Hope Crew and our work to support the preservation movement. Hope Crew is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And for 70 years, the National Trust has led the movement to save America's historic places. A privately funded nonprofit organization, we work to save America's historic sites, tell the full American story, build stronger communities, and invest in preservation's future. Hope Crew is the Trust Trades Training Arm, and that's what I'll be talking with you about today. And Hope Crew is an acronym that stands for Hands On Preservation Experience. 
A common example that highlights the need for and shortage of skilled trades labor is in the event of natural disasters. This pictured here is the aftermath of Hurricane Hugo on Charleston, South Carolina, which is a common case study in preservation. And now I'm gonna read an excerpt. A disaster such as Hurricane Hugo, which devastated Charleston in 1989, dramatically illustrates that conservation of the built environment is fundamentally dependent on the skill and availability of the men and women who do the actual physical work of preservation. In the weeks following the storm, the shortage of tradespeople with the knowledge and skills to repair the historic fabric of Charleston's older buildings quickly emerged as one of the greatest challenges of the rebuilding effort. And that's from Lisa Sasser in a piece titled, Why the Trades Matter for Preservation. And Hope Crew is thankfully one of the few trades training programs that exists nationally and across the country to de that deploy different tactics and methodologies to address this shortage. Hope Crew is a model that's heavily partnership-based and our team works with trades experts across the country to lead experiential training programs, which are typically two to six weeks in length. And they showcase foundational preservation trade skills, which are skills used to steward the built environment, such as masonry, carpentry, um, mortar repointing, painting historic materials, the skills we need to care for historic building stock. In its most recent iterations, Hope Crew has been working with historic sites, and we partner with youth serving organizations, universities, and other affinity and advocacy groups to source local participants to work on sites in their own communities. This also helps our site partners receive often deferred or necessary maintenance for their historic buildings. And we're funded separately through grants, task agreements, donations, and corporate and foundation support. Because we are the National Trust for Historic Preservation, we also look for synergy and overlap with other programs and initiatives to further capitalize on our work. And this includes overlap with two initiatives of the Trust, which is the Where Women Made History campaign and the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. In 20, the Where Women Made History campaign crowdsourced over 1,000 places in all 50 states showcasing the unknown and underrepresented stories of women as professionals, artists, activists, scholars, entrepreneurs, and preservationists. And through this campaign, we've launched efforts to focus on the lack of women in the trades. I'm reading a report from CII, which is the Construction Institute out of UT Austin. Although underrepresented groups such as women represent a huge labor pool, they are not always welcomed into the construction industry. Regarding participation of women craft workers, a study conducted by the National Women's Law Center in 2012 indicated that the percentage of women in construction trades has remained almost the same from 1983 to 2010. This creates a major contrast between jobs in construction industry and other industries regarding gender diversification. In fact, the percentage of women in many occupations that used to be more male dominated have increased during the same period, 83 to 2010. Meanwhile, construction trades pay better than many job opportunities for women and they could be attracted into the industry if contractors could provide a better work environment. As the study discussed, increasing female participation in construction craft occupations is one of the quickest solutions available to the industry to reduce its skilled workforce shortage. So in July, we partnered with Oregon Tradeswomen, University of Oregon, and Tongue Point Job Corps to bring the first majority women's hope crew in the program's seven years of, of existence. The, pro, the project was all women in leadership and majority women for the crew, including the trades expert, who was Ariana McCow. She's founder and president of an Oakland-based Zilani Glass Conservation. Macau was also the first woman to receive a master's degree in stained glass conservation from the Royal College of Art in London. The Odd Fellows building was also saved and is now owned and operated by women and is home to three women owned businesses. And that's really one thing that I love about Hope Crew and it's one thing that we're very proud of is that in telling the full American story, we're able to craft experiences that let underrepresented groups see themselves in the preservation movement. This is a rough breakdown of the numbers of Hope Crew's impact, although those numbers have gone up now. Hope Crew has three general umbrellas or models in which we interface with the public. The first one is introduction to the trades and that's also the, the one that the Oddfellows Project falls into as well. We secure funding, find a historic site in need and source local youth to help address a site's need. 
These experiences are typically the two to six week ones in length and they result in a building feature being restored or preserved based on the Secretary of Interior standards. For this Odd Fellows project, the trades expert and crew focused on scraping and reglazing the historic clear story windows on site. Preservation in practice is the second model in which we interface with the public and it was a three-way partnership is between the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the National Park Service, and the National Trust. This program focuses on HBCU architecture students. And the intention of preservation in practice was never really to create more tradespeople, but more so to create more preservation-minded future architects. In a non-COVID year, this would be a six-week in-person experience, and it would include a HOPE crew on the students' campuses, along with two other in-person experiences focused on preservation in the trades. I'll speak a little bit more about this model in a moment. And the third way that Hope Crew interfaces with the public is through large scale volunteer projects that engage large groups of the public in a very simple, low scale trade for the good of a historic site. Pictured here is Hinchcliffe Stadium, which was built by the city of Patterson, New Jersey in 1932. And it was closed in 1996 and fell victim to neglect and vandalism. Hinchcliffe is one of the few remaining stadiums associated with Negro League baseball. And for this project, a team of 700 volunteers from Hope Crew, Youth Corps, and other affiliations uh, worked together to repaint Hinchcliffe's walls in one day. And it's been interesting coming on as a director of a hands-on program during a global pandemic, but thankfully we've remained busy through virtual work and light return to the field. Um, I'll showcase one of our digital pivots we made with preservation in practice um, to wrap up my time. I mentioned a few slides ago that preservation in practice is the model where we typically interface with HBCU architecture students on a three-part in-person experience. And when we learned we wouldn't be in person again in 2021, we took to crafting an experience that would better align with the training that aspiring architects are receiving. Since the, global, uh, since the goal was never to cultivate more tradespeople with this touch point. So my background is actually architecture and my colleague on the team, Molly Baker, she has a background in trades. So we looked for the crosshairs of where preservation, trades and architecture align. And one of the areas that stood out was documentation. So with funding from the National Park Service, we piloted a six week digital documentation fellowship for three architecture students who are pictured here. And they worked with point cloud data for a site of African-American heritage significance, which was the poet Langston Hughes home in Harlem. The students created measured drawings of the house in Revent and worked on a submission board and a website that was intended to explore how to make heritage resources more accessible to the public. Their drawings and studies resulted in a Library of Congress submission for the Holland Prize competition. And we knew early on that only a sliver of Library of Congress documentation shares the history of African American heritage sites. So through this program, there is one more accessible in there. And the students all remarked that they had no idea how much preservation was related to architecture and they were shocked that they could use the skills that they were learning in school for architecture towards the preservation movement. And if I haven't stated it plainly, I, I really love and value the nimbleness of Hope Crew that we can maintain and craft experiences that really make preservation and the trades real to the next wave of the potential workforce. We've piloted hundreds of experiences, touched thousands of people, and helped to make this potential career one that connects people and helps them find and see a vision for themselves in the field. Um, so thank you for listening about Hope Crew, and I will pass it on to our next panelist. Okay. Hope everybody can see that okay. Um, hello, my name is Laura Lepping. I use she, her pronouns, and I am currently serving as the board vice chair for Northern Bedrock Historic Preservation Corps. Um, and I'm also a 2017 alumni of the program. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge that Northern Bedrock is based in Minnesota, the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota, Anishinaabe, and other indigenous people. As an organization centered on place-based history of work, we acknowledge that many buildings we work on only exist due to the history of violence and erasure of indigenous people. We must recognize that this history has shaped our landscapes, environments, and communities with which we work now. In turn, these trade skills that we seek to teach represent only a small portion of the intangible heritage that exists in the memory of the land that makes up Minnesota.
I would like to share a little bit about Northern Bedrock. Uh, Northern Bedrock's mission is to develop enduring workforce and life skills through service learning his in historic preservation and community stewardship. Our values are serving, transforming, preserving, and honoring. Our organization follows in the footsteps of the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC. The core model seeks to lessen the skills gap between education and employment. Corps are locally based organizations that engage young people in service projects that provide in demand skills training through service learning and community engagement. We utilize a campaign program model and provide core members hands on experience in historic preservation, community service, and conservation. We provide a variety of skills training to help prepare our core members for their career paths. Core members also practice community living, leadership, and team building skills as they work to complete a successful field season. We have consultants, technical specialists, and project hosts that provide technical training and project supervision and complete work projects alongside our crews. Core members also learn the value of team building, effective communication, goal setting, and conflict resolution. Um, in this presentation, my goal is to share how Northern Bedrock is thinking creatively about trades education and how to connect with interested learners beyond the development of specific hard skills. The areas I'm talking about today are connected people, and places, embracing intersections, and finally craft sustain, self-sustainability and agency. On this slide, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, there is a map showing the 2020 service projects that Northern Bedrock completed. Um, and it has little numbers uh, across the map showing where our different projects were um, clustered. Go the right way. So connecting people and places. Um, I want to start with a quote from a community member from Frontenac, Minnesota, which hosted a crew completing a cemetery restoration project during our 2020 field season. Uh, the quote reads, they were as interested in the history of our village and cemetery as much as the old people living here are. Preser preservation was as important to them as to us. The changes they have brought to our cemetery are incredible. Stones which now can be red, stones which have been put back together, stones which have were formerly buried have been brought to light, all an incredible betterment. But the most incredible thing they brought, at least to me, was hope for the future in, the ne in this next generation. We are in good hands. What our community partners so eloquently observed was the power and importance of connecting people and places. The work completed by our core members took on meaning beyond the physical restoration of the cemetery, ultimately building connections between people from different places, cultures, and generations. In the words of one of our core members, not everything you do is something you came expecting to do or wanting to do, but that does not make it any less important to the project hosts and to you as a core member. Through these experiences in many different communities, core members on the importance of preservation and the impact of saving these sites. In many cases, the areas are more than just places. They are sites that provide community and collect stories of the many people that pass through its halls. This approach draws on reports such as the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Preservation for People, A Vision for the Future, which outlines the need for people-centered preservation, um, which empowers people to tell stories and to engage in saving the places that matter to them. In many ways, we view our program as one way for young people to feel empowered to be change agents in their own communities. After each field season, we hope that our core members will bring back the skills to the spaces, places, and people important to them and understand how to turn their knowledge into action. When Northern Bedrock works on increasing interest in preservation trades, we realize we also must consider how to foster people's relationships to sites, buildings, and landscapes. And so to draw on the words of historian Dolores Hayden, quote, if Americans were to find their own social history preserved in the landscape of their own neighborhoods and cities, their connection to the past might be different. On this side, on this slide, you can see four images uh, across the center, which show different Northern Bedrock core members lifting a cemetery stone with a wooden tripod.
So the National Trust for Historic Preservation's report also makes the point that historic preservation can be fully incorporated into the work of related fields. These intersections reveal the unique opportunity for preservation trades, workforce development programs to think creatively about growing interests in the field. One way Northern Bedrock is exploring these connections is through the work of our AmeriCorps VISTA member, who is exploring how to increase our organizational capacity to provide equitable access to historic preservation training and education by developing engaging community-focused programming. Examples of the activities they all complete are collaboratively developing a historic preservation ambassador program, uh, which will connect historic preservation professionals with neighborhoods looking to revitalize their local communities. Um, it also, they will also cultivate relationships with local communities, develop uh, the Northern Better Can Do, uh, local network of historic preservation professionals, and also they will develop a list of historic preservation professionals, resources, education, and hands-on training opportunities to increase access to historic preservation resources in Minnesota. In our conversations on connecting more people with preservation trades, we have become committed to discussing historic preservation social impacts. A couple of examples include discussions on economic and environmental impacts. The economics of historic preservation closely connects to conversations about connecting with communities, especially community development. According to the report by Place Economics, commissioned by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, quote, there was a consistent message um, and the research on the relationship between historic preservation and economics is critical and needs to be provided on a regular basis. Additionally, research on sustainability, efficiency, and environmental impact have become ingrained in traditional trade discussions, whether that's considering trade practices regarding climate change or results uh, such as those published by the National Trust uh, in their saving windows, saving money, evaluating the energy performance of window retrofit and replacement. Overall, historic preservation is intertwined with many contemporary concerns. By incorporating these related fields and exploring these intersections, we feel that we can expand the reach and level of participation in historic preservation. On this slide, there is a large photo of core members uh, restoring plaster in a old church. So again, I'm going to start with a quote. Um, this one is from one of our core members. Um, it reads, when I can learn and perform how to preserve something with its original technique, then I can help the people around me understand history. We have surveyed our current and past core members about their experiences and how they approach and view the trades. We have noticed that many are approaching traditional trades from a crafts and self-sustainability self practice rather than viewing their training as a preparation for a career. It's an important distinction as we frame traditional trades work, especially when previous efforts to reach young adults have not translated to an influx of new professionals. In many ways, this touches on what professionals in the art and trades world have dubbed the revival of the arts and crafts movement. This movement, similar to the original in the late 1800s, um, means that it is a movement of people who stand in opposition to mass consumerism and who are working to create unique handcrafted products. An explanation and description I find helpful is from an article by um, on the blog uh, Contrato. Uh, in it, the author explains that, quote, what once seemed like impossibility to the arts and crafts movement has become much more of a reality in its revival. Still very much a socialist, economic, and now also environmental movement, people are moving away from fast fashion and mass production, but they are also embracing the modern advancements that make these more traditional methods possible to produce on a more realistic scale. In the current climate, we are focusing more and more on sustainability and integrating this into best practices across the board." End quote. Um, in conjunction with the desire for self-sustainability, the revival of the arts and crafts movement reveals a potential shift in the stigmatization of trades and craft work. When we do outreach and discuss historic preservation trades, we can first ask ourselves questions such as, what is the difference between a craftsperson and a tradesperson? <laughs> or how has this resurgence affected societal views on vocational trades and careers? And in what ways can we embrace the new driving ethos of young adults exploring skills and training opportunities so they can better see themselves in this field? We do have resources to draw on to think about this topic. 
Um, in his book, The Craftsman, Richard Sennett describes an important quality of craftsmen in which craftsmanship means an enduring basic human impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. What Sennett describes dovetails well with the well-known North Bennett Street School Sloyd system of manual training, which quote, encourages a great sense of care and commitment to excellence. And ultimately the method seeks to teach the whole person how to make a living and how to lead a fuller life, unquote. The school's Sloyd system reflects Senate's sentiments and reaffirms the high level of quality that the term craft can imply. In the framework of reviving traditional trades, education programs might consider how to foster a more healthy and balanced work environment that fosters learners' desires to create quality items while allowing for innovation and autonomy. On this slide, there are three images. Uh, the one on the top shows one of our technical specialists um, uh, creating a form for a historic masonry project. The center shows a picture looking down at a bunch of core members' booths. And the one at the very bottom uh, shows another image from the masonry project where a core member is using a jackhammer to uh, take away some of the old mortar. So these topics represent just an overview of a few conversation or few conversations our organization is having and how we are working to adapt our programming to fit into our contemporary context. Our hope is to continue exploring new avenues of how to relate to potential learners and how to connect to our broader communities, people, and histories. And with that, uh, I'm going to pass it on to our next presenter, Anne. Thank you, Laura. Can everybody see this screen? All right, can everybody see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry about that. All right, thank you, everybody. I told you, uh, Katie, it would be me with the technical difficulties, but uh, I am Ann Cuss. I'm from the World Monuments Fund. I am the incoming regional director of North America. Thank you so much to all of our other uh, presenters so far. It's, it's been great, good information. And I'm really excited to talk to you about our own Bridge to Crafts career uh, program. So to give you some background, um, the Bridge to Crafts Career Program, I'm gonna to refer to it as B2CC to keep it simple. Uh, it started in the spring of 2015 with a class of 10 interns at the Woodlawn Cemetery in Bronx in New York. Um, Woodlawn is one of the largest um, historic cemeteries as well as a national historic landmark. Um, this was our pilot initiative. It's to address the shortage of skilled trades and craftspeople who are qualified to work on historic resources in New York. Um, I'm, I'm sure not to tell anybody on the call or, or participating that New York is a wealth of all different types, styles, materials, um, all kinds of properties and historic resources. So B2CC was formed to connect the city's underrepresented youth. Um, we're talking people typically ages from 18 to 24. There is a high school component that we'll, we'll touch on briefly in a couple slides. And it's to connect um, the city's youth with hands-on training and education opportunities in masonry and stone preservation. And really this is a program created um, for people who didn't have any immediate plans um, for post-secondary school. So young people still trying to figure it out, maybe have decided um, that college or a, another type of school like that is not for them, but we still wanted to make sure that these young people had a path to economic independence through the historic trades to both address the shortage of qualified uh, workers and to carry on the crafts. Um, we can't do this without our partners. Um, it takes a lot to, to go into a program. We partner with the International Masonry Institute or the IMI. They are the training arm of the Bricklayers and Allied Crafts Union. They also um, provide us with our, our, our core curriculum and the link to the resident craftspeople um, that are associated with the Bricklayers and Allied Crafts Union. The resident craftsperson along with the in-house conserver, Hi Neela, 
um, they, they work day to day on site with the interns to deliver all the educational materials and the historic context for our sites. The Bricklayers and Allied Crafts Union, like I just mentioned, now this is an, a union and organization that has been operating since 1865. Um, and this is where there's a wealth of, of the trowel trades, as we call them. So your bricklayers, stone, marble, cement masons, plasters, tile setters, anyone who works with a trowel, they not only work to provide jobs um, and economic opportunities for their workers, but they also work to improve the, the quality of life for workers and their families. We also partner with a local so social service agency. Um, these organizations provide additional support and, and learning activities that aren't directly associated with historic uh, trades or preservation. And that includes financial literacy training, um, assisting with job placement after the, the cohorts have finished and some of the soft skills as we call them um, that include preparing for interviews, pr uh, preparing resumes and a review. And they also uh, provide additional support to entrance post cohort, cohort excuse me, that are centered around um, issues like transportation, food and housing securities, because we all know it's very difficult to get to job, to get to work when you, you don't have those things lined up in your life nicely. Obviously, we partner with a host cemetery. Um, since this program has started in New York, we've worked with Woodlawn Cemetery, Greenwood Cemetery, and Rye African American Cemeteries. This is where the, the project will take, take place and the bulk of the day-to-day -day preservation activities. Uh, to the left of my screen here, it, could, it can range something like the mausoleum, the Kent Mausoleum, or um, individual smaller gravestones, markers, monuments. It, it just depends on the needs of our partner sites. Um, and again, from time to time, we'll partner with preservation and restoration employers that have been local to New York, um, so they can have some time with the interns to tell them about the industry and some of the projects they have coming up. And we found that as the years have gone on from 2015, that a lot of the local New York companies are actually requesting interns who have graduated the program because of the quality of material and education. Um, so we have we have a basic criteria for each cohort. Um, the host cemetery has to be historically significant. Both Greenwood and Woodlawn are considered national historic landmarks. But that's not to say that we won't work with smaller sites or help them support because that, that's really the criteria and where some of these threatened sites are is in these smaller local led and locally cared for cemeteries and burial sites. Um, we do require that the host cemetery is located near a bricklayers and allied craft training facility. And that is because as part of our recruitment process, each intern um, will have to take a, a small hand skills test to make sure they have the aptitude. And again, the training facility provides additional classroom um, and hands-on space for interns to obtain some of their certifications and extra support throughout the program. We do work um, with a, a qualified social service agency. So what that really means is partnering with the 501c3 or 4 uh, organization, nonprofit that has a mission of, of helping, um, helping out our underrepresented youth. And really, this is where a lot of our recruitment and our candidate pool comes from, because these are the, the ears to the ground and they know what's going on with people individually and who may be a good fit, who may really benefit or, or connect with this program. Um, and again, we also want to make sure that the cities that we partner with, which, you know, it's, it's been New York, but we want to make sure going forward that the market has the capacity to provide for a historic trades focused job upon graduation, because the goal is to really shorten the gap between the last day of the cohort and the first day of the new trades job. So we want to make sure that we're setting people up for success by placing them in areas where there's projects to work on. So our guiding curriculum is informed by the International Masonry Institute, as I said. Um, this is a, an abridged version. This is by no means the exhaustive list of, of what's covered, but this is, this is a good introduction to it. Typically, each cohort is a 10-week program. Um, first, the interns are exposed to the, the Secretary of Interior Standards and the guidelines for the treatment of historic properties. You know, and really that information covers what does it mean when something is historic? Why do we care about it? How do you treat materials when you encounter them? So there's overview of information that's continually reinforced throughout the, the cohort. Everybody um, will receive and is expected to adhere to basic site safety practices. That means interns or CEOs or the president himself 
Um, if you've ever worked with me, you know that I really take it seriously that safety is everybody's job. So we want to get those habits started early in someone's career and get them familiar with what's expected. And that rolls into um, exposing the interns to the materials and products that we commonly use in historic preservation and restoration. So they're learn they learn a basic overview of chemistry interactions, um, how to read product and materials data sheets, and how all of those things interact and play into safety so that the, all of the day-to-day -day activities are safe for both of the intern and the resource that we work on. Interns also learn an overview into you know, documentation standards. So that inc includes making a measure drawing, learning how to do things to scale, how to take a good a conditions photograph, um, because this continually becomes an issue in the field. I don't know how many of you have gotten conditions reports or, or field field visit notes with photos that look like you're uh, trying to find Bigfoot because everything is blurry and unframed. It's my personal mission to uh, combat that in our industry. So we make sure that everybody has a good orientation to that. The interns will also learn <clears throat> basic stone identification and typology. So what's brick, what's granite, what's marble? How do those things interact? Where do they come from? And how that shows up in different themes and time periods um, in, in historic architecture. The interns use all of these skills and information to learn how to do a conditions analysis. And that's really orienting people with the language of preservation and, and the materials and conservation sciences. So they understand what's a step crack, uh, what's a lintel, what, what, are, what does sugaring mean? We wanna get people comfortable with speaking to each other and learning this, this jargon. So it makes them better tradespeople. And of course, all of these, um, all of these things are, are rolled into teaching what's the basic appropriate maintenance and repair methods for historic resources. And that's something that's reinforced day to day on site. Each intern has the opportunity to gain a couple certifications that we hope will give them just a little more employable competitive edge as they enter the workforce. So that means that um, the interns have the opportunity to earn their Occupational Safety Health Administration or OSHA 10 or 30, depending on the cohort. Um, as well as their standing and swing scaffolding certifications, aerial lift operators. So that's your scissor lift, your boom lift, your cherry picker, whatever you refer to it as. And very excitingly, um, the interns are also participating in a yawn mortar patching class and certification. I mentioned we have a, uh, a high school component earlier, and this is our partnership with the city's Department of Education for the Rising Senior Summer Program. It's much of the same information that's carried out in the 10 week cohort. It's just abridged due to the constraints of summer. Um, and it's aimed at high school juniors and seniors who are in some kind of, um, you know, architecture, heart, arts, uh, high school to set them up to exposure to real field activities. And typically that's between seven and 10 interns in each cohort. Um, it's all the same things of a regular B2CC. It's just pared down for age appropriateness and time appropriateness. So looking at some of the successes since 2015, um, especially coming into this position, as Katie mentioned, um, I, I'm happy to report that to date, uh, we have 170 graduating interns from our 10 week program. And how that shakes out, it's about a 98% completion graduation rate Occasionally, there's been a dropout for some mitigating circumstances, or someone may have started the program and realized that the historic trades are not for them, and that's fine. This is, these are things that we'd rather find out sooner than later, as we're setting people up for um, careers and their livelihood. 80% um, <clears throat> of our interns go on to uh, some kind of preservation-associated firm, and, and of our graduates, about 20% of them actually um, qualify for the three-year apprenticeship program that's offered by the BAC, and that's a three-year paid apprenticeship at a, a very livable rate, um, with also that partners them with additional job opportunities and educational opportunities, as, as well as membership in the union. Looking at our data, um, it's interesting, some of the other presenters have mentioned the women in the trade so far, and I'm happy to report that the median of our participation for people identifying as women is 33% across the board. You know, you look at the first uh, demographics of the, the first cohort for B2CC, I think there was one person participating, but that's gradually increased, and it makes me very happy to see that about a third of our, our 
interns or women because um, there's a 2018 report from the uh, Institute of Women in the Trades, I believe it is, that they report that um, women in the trades are actually earning 33% more than their counterparts in the United States, at least in non-trades fields. So what all of this shakes out to is about 55,000 hours of hands-on preservation and education. Um, that's real time, you know, a combination of classroom, but mostly site work that not only sets people up a good introduction, real honest introduction to what it's like working, you know, hard labor every day, but that also translates to address some of the maintenance backlog and maintenance needs of our, our partner sites. So everybody is benefiting from this program. We are so ecstatic with how it's been successful in New York, and we're looking at other ways to take this model um, and, and apply it to other parts of the United States, because really what we're all talking about today is the trades and trades apprenticeships as a means of economic recovery. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm living through my second once in a lifetime economic collapse and it's been rough. So anything that we can do to get young people caring for historic resources and, and self-sufficient financially is, is always a good thing in this country. It's also an opportunity for us to highlight underrepresented heritage throughout the United States. I mentioned that we work with uh, underrepresented populations. So that could be women, that could be people who are of African-American descent, Hispanic descent, Latin, uh, queer people, it doesn't matter. We want to understand these stories and we want to highlight the importance of how all of these things have contributed to the American experience and especially of the individual experiences of, of these groups. Um, because what's really all about is promoting the environmental and cultural value of places, people and stories of our partner sites. And as we all know, there's a lot of work to be done and World Monuments is very uh, ecstatic to contribute to the legacy of these places. And that's it for me. I'm Ann Cuss. You can reach me at acuss at wmf.org if you have any questions or know anyone across the United States who may be looking to benefit from this program. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into Q&A here. Can I ask everybody to join us back on the screen? I want to thank the Preservation League for bringing together such a dynamic group of people. Uh, this was really impressive. You, I have a lot of questions for you. I encourage the audience to, to please put some more questions into the Q&A. We've got plenty of time to, uh, to go through them. Uh, I'm with the uh, State Historic Preservation Office here in New York. I just wanted to state that since the you know, creation of the, of the SHPO uh, following the 1966 Historic Preservation Act, uh, our office has been deeply concerned about the trades. And I'm a, quite a student about the history of our programming. And I've seen all the way back into the early 1970s that we've been trying to figure out ways to address this critical workforce shortage. Uh, I want to note that in 2015, when New York State completed their mandatory uh, State Historic Preservation Plan, uh, the number one priority to emerge from data collection from that was the development of traditional trades programming. Uh, in response to that, the New York State SHPO has worked with um, Preservation Buffalo Niagara, Landmark Society of Western New York, and the Historic Albany Foundation to create curriculum in New York State. Uh, so far, we've come up with classes in windows, masonry, and the current offering in plaster. I do want to note to this group that in beginning our data collection for our brand new plan, we saw a significant dip in uh, the public's response, which was over 3,500 members of the public and over 1,000 uh, members from colleague groups and people with awareness of preservation, that historic trade seemed to take a dip. Now, things that did rise was the need for more diversity, equity, and inclusion in preservation. That's a great thing. And uh, New Yorkers having serious concerns about resiliency efforts. Trades is still in there and still remains a priority. Uh, so I want to get to some of these questions so we can help out, uh, help out New Yorkers. Um, I have a quick question from Caitlin. Uh, she's directing this to Anne, and I made a note of this too. She's asked, have you encountered any issues in getting the unions to understand that historic masonry is a different beast and requires different training than most modern day masons receive? That's a really good question. And I'm going to, I'm going to be very, um, 
transparent with you is coming into this new, um, this isn't something that I've heard of from our partners who are very, very honest and very good about communicating the needs, but the BAC, it's, they have their own, as well as the IMI, they have their own uh, specialty in historic masonry, which deals with this exactly. So um, I haven't heard any rumblings about it, but I know that this is an issue from in, in other areas of the country. It is something to be aware of, but not nothing that I've heard of so far. A follow-up question I, I had. I, I have found it a bit of a struggle engaging with unions to look at look at curriculum that we've been offering. They seem to be very focused on, on a journey person's track of five plus years before they can get continuing education. Any tips for encouraging unions to uh, take a serious look at the work that we're doing here? Is, is that to me or is that to the group? <laughs> That is to the group. Okay, I, good. Someone else saw. Unions in their role. I, Natalie and I uh, work together often. We're on a couple of task force together, um, including one convened by the National Trust and the Partners Network. And it's something that we are looking at as well. It's, um, it's something that we hear a lot, that it is very difficult engaging with the unions and getting them to see preservation as a worthy overlay or skill set to learning about building new materials. Um, IMI is one that is documented as a really great partner and has worked with preservationists at us, the National Trust, and working with Preservation Maryland, um, with you and as well too. And we're trying to use them as a case study or model to bring other unions into the fold, um, trying to show the, the economic benefit, the benefit to their union people and trying to get other people on board with it too. But it is very documented that it's been a challenge working with the unions. Natalie, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I had talked with a few different union members and a lot of what it comes back to is they need to show some type of benefit for their members because they represent their members. So the IMI works, they're a, the educational wing of the Bricklayers Union. And they said the 2008 economic recession was a very good example of how preservation training could be demonstrated to benefit their members. A lot of new construction dried up, but a lot of restoration work happened. So there was a proven economic benefit for cross-training uh, new construction bricklayers with historic masonry. And so they've been a very good partner in that regards of showing the benefits and um, methods of adding preservation training to unions. And there has been some interest in other unions now because they have, um, I think they rolled it out in about 10 years ago, maybe more. And so other unions have seen the success of it and are interested in those types of things. Um, and I've also talked to IMI about how there could be a way for historic preservation masons to join that union very nascent stages, but if you can show some pathways for preservation people to join the unions, that means more union members, which means the long life of the union. So again, the benefit to union members of having more people join. Um, so there, that's a lot of what it comes down to is what is the benefit for people learning? And I think we can show that with a lot of what we've been working on. All right, so here's a question about maritime history. Yeah, particularly, we have a lot of it in New York State. And through the nation, wondering if you guys have any experience with uh, workforce programs that involve historic boats, uh, similar skills, but not permanent buildings on land. A number of boating museums would be very interested. Does anybody want to take that on? No experience with it, but I saw that comment in the Q&A and thought that it was a great point. One thing about Hope Crew is that we typically interface with people with no experience in preservation or the trade. So we look for little crosshairs like that, like the, the overlap with um, Maritime to, to find new people. Um, as everyone was talking about their programs, Hope Crew, as I mentioned, is more experiential. I, I've kind of come to think of it as more workforce cultivation than workforce development. You, you wouldn't go through a two-week program and be able to go onto a job site um, and they are expensive to run. I know there's a, a question in there about funding as well too that we can all speak to. Um, but we, in cultivating, we are basically trying to get people to even know that this is a pathway earlier on. So um, a lot of us are doing work with overlays with unions and trying to work with tradespeople who don't have the preservation lens and add that on top. And then there's also the pipeline cultivation of just letting people know that this is something that you can do. So 
I that's something that I would like to look into overlap with maritime and just letting other people who wouldn't have known about preservation know that it's a, a career as well. Great. Uh, um, I, I just want to note that our crews have worked on an historic boat in Duluth, Minnesota. So it's a Niji tugboat. And so uh, I think there is opportunities and we've worked with actually a private historic preservation trades expert to, to do that. Um, and in particular, working on the windows of the boat. And so there are transferable skills um, that I think are already very established. So wood window restoration, that was something that our crew members knew how to do and were able to help with that. I'll also say when uh, I was working out west in Point Reyes National Seashore, they have a historic boat there. And it does take a lot of um, very specified knowledge. And the my boss at the time had specified knowledge about how often you need to go into the water, the type of materials you actually needed. So it's also, I think, you know, mapping those experts who may not be in any official organization. I think that's something all of us are wrestling with of, you know, very specific knowledge by people who are sometimes very difficult to find. Um, and for us, it's been, you know, really just trying to source these technical experts from, you know, locally in Minnesota, but also just adjacent states as well. Great. I know this topic is, is always on the mind of the Preservation League, who's done outstanding advocacy for the tugboat urger. Um, so next question, and this is kind of for all as well, uh, for local preservation organizations running or developing a preservation trades training program, what are some of the best sources of funding? How do you make your programs financially sustainable? Tough one, it's always about funding. It comes down to it, which can be difficult. I'll start. So B2CC and the World of Monuments Fund is a little bit different because we do have um, private or corporate donors that are very generous and, and give us the leeway to support initiatives like this. So I know that everybody is not in that, um, you know, that situation. So I, Milana, could there be the Broom Grant? Could there be some of the National Park Services grants for smaller community or underrepresented heritage that could be utilized for uh, local levels like this? The National Trust has um, a number of different grant programs. Uh, so if there are local 501c3s who are looking to do something in their community, um, trying to do workforce development or training programs would be something that would be eligible for some of those grants. They're competitive, but um, the National Trust also applies for grants from national funders, foundations. Um, I think a lot of workforce training programs, trades training programs could fall under community investment. So we've explored banks and other people who um, might like to invest in their communities locally. We are a national program, so we will look at local sources and then do a project in that community, which would be a likely model for um, a local organization to follow as well too. But the funding is a major piece of this, both because it costs to do the programs, it costs for the materials, it costs to do the restoration, but um, I would also advocate that people pay those going through the training in trying to change, um, I believe it was Laura saying in her presentation, trying to change the public perception of trades and dignify the trades. Part of that is paying people. Um, we live in a consumer society and our dollar is our voice and we, we pay people for things that, val that are of value. And when you try to put people through training programs for the trades and don't pay them, it's not really communicating that this is a, a valued profession. Um, so part of the funding I always advocate should go towards paying participants. Hope Crew pays our participants unless we work with a, a youth organization that doesn't allow paying the participants because it's for uh, credit or training or something. But otherwise, we, we always work to pay people. That's great. So I would notice in the courses that we've developed within New York State, it's a worthy model for anybody to adopt. The SHPO is happy to work with you. Uh, in Buffalo, their program was linked up with a local bank. I know that Landmark Society of Western New York has worked with private foundations, Historic Albany, and the location of the makerspace where we host those programs uh, was able to utilize Main Street funds. There is, is not a shortage of, of um workforce development money out there committed through New York State. So I would also look to New York State's Workforce Development Institute. Okay, Natalie jumped, oh, go on. 
Oh, yeah, I just wanted to jump in on the funding part real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, to your point, we're trying to work to make sure that there's public funding available for this. There is through a lot of apprenticeship programs that vary state by state, but sometimes there's incentives both for the training program and for employers to hire. You can get direct funding or tax credits for hiring apprentices. Um, but yeah, we actually want to have state funding come through to support training programs so they can pay participants, help fund projects, and get people into the workforce. So we're trying to get uh, a template available for other people via Maryland and that we can work in other states. And I know probably a lot of these programs to receive AmeriCorps funding, um, and that's through a lot of youth corps as well. Usually you have to show a 25% match, either in-kind or some type of private funding that comes in, but that is a source of federal public funding available for these type of programs. All right, Natalie, I'm going to put you on the spot one more time because you answered an interesting question in the Q&A. Uh, Johanna had asked to uh, noticed that, you know, it seems like with the 250th anniversary of the Rev War, there always seems to be some synergy around historic preservation every 50 years. And you had noted some places to look uh, related to the 250th anniversary. Yes, I just received a little bit of an email chain about how we can start some training programs. It's very much in the planning stages, so now is time to get your voice into that. I put a couple links in. It's America250.org. There is a uh, Parks Preservation Public Spaces Advisory Council. It was announced back in July, but there is also a link where you can plop in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Uh, you can put in your uh, thoughts for what it should be. So if there's a lot of public support for these type of training programs, then there might be more money that comes that way as well. Great, Jet. Johanna submitted an, another, uh, another thing here. In the Hudson Valley, they are frustrated with the lack of trades training and therefore founded a certificate program in historic preservation at SUNY uh, Westchester Peakskill Campus. Great. Uh, we had the misfortune of starting when COVID was beginning, so it's been a rough start. But as we get on our feet, perhaps a conversation with Shippo about collaborating. Um, yes, absolutely, Shippo would collaborate. And I believe Natalie would also collaborate. We've been talking about some of our existing curriculum development. She talked about curriculum development. So, Johanna, we would love to connect following this. Next question uh, might be directed towards Anne. Are you thinking about expanding the program beyond cemeteries? Uh, to churches and other historic buildings? What about brick laying and pointing as well as stonework? So some of the brick laying and that happens at some of the, the sites um, that we already do, but <clears throat> there, is, there is a discussion and there is an idea that we're gonna expand, um, I think my vision and, and our vision at WMF would be to expand in the materials, uh, conservation and preservation practices. So thinking about, um, and, and Laura, you know this, like a back of your hand windows, if they're wood or if they're metal, they're always at risk of being ripped out because there just aren't people to, to treat them and care for them appropriately or to you know draft maintenance plans so that they don't get to these chaotic states. So you know metals is another area um, that I would like to see. There's so many monuments, um, statues, memorials all across the United States and city, a lot of them are city backed or municipally funded. And again, they're lacking. Um, I think that we may be open to the types of um, places and sites. Um, I don't know about sacred spaces. That's not something that we've really broached, um, but yeah, we're, we're open to it. All right, I have a question from Joe. He's asking how can a small business preservation contractor be involved in these programs to both help and benefit from them? Throw it out to the whole group. Again, we work with, um, I, I believe someone else mentioned the model too, maybe it was Laura, we work with trades experts. Um, so if they're, if you'd like to get in touch, um, I'll, I'll put my contact information. I'm sure any of us um, will as well. But we, if we get a funding and a project that's local New York, we would look for local trades experts and local youth to, to work on the project. So if you are somebody with that skill set, um, you're somebody that we would like to have that skill set passed on to a younger generation. So typically, I believe um, you or anyone else who is interested in had this skill set would be a trades expert for a project. Yes, I'd also uh, like to point out Joe. He's a member of the 
or a board member on Preservation Trades Network. I saw a few others on there as well, uh, Jane, Jim, and Amanda. So thanks guys for coming. <laughs> um, that is the network of professional trades people. We love to have any involvement with them. They are the subject matter experts. I see a lot of, um, I guess, I run a small business as well, window restoration business. And so I see some of that problem of having the capacity to hire people and apprentices and spend the time training. It's very intensive. And I know a lot of smaller businesses and individual craftspeople have that trouble too. I think a lot of these training programs are really great opportunities to engage their knowledge in a capacity that they can handle too and not put the burden on them as an individual business. You can uh, engage them for these training stints, you know, bring them on for a short-term project where they can just focus on the education and still get compensated as a subject matter expert. I think that's a very um, easy pathway to exchange that knowledge in a way that uh, it doesn't put the burden again on an individual business to carry the load of trades training. I add it. And so I do also want to note that um, I think there is different ways to engage in workforce development. And I think one of them is actually training people who are interested in going into these fields. But I think also it's just educating communities about what's out there. Um, and so I will highlight, there is another organization in Minnesota called Rethos that does community trades education classes. And so although it's not do, providing super in depth, you know, nitty gritty of how to do everything, it's at least making it more common knowledge that this exists. And so it makes it easier then to start having those um, those conversations, but also like for community members and people growing up in those communities to see it as a possibility and as like a career path or topic to explore. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and yes, also Northern Red Rock does use technical specialists. And so we look for local technical specialists for each of our different projects across Minnesota currently. Um, and so we really like to engage with that kind of one-on-one -on -one experience with technical specialists. Um, I just want to know one of the questions here, Ethel Tias, who is an absolutely amazing community advocate in the Crown Heights North and uh, Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood is asking who to contact. Uh, Ethel, hi. Uh, you, you can reach out to this entire group and we'll make the, the contact information available. Uh, your work in Crown Heights is amazing, designated three phases of Crown Heights as a, a local New York City district and got them all placed on the National Register. They're pretty amazing. So looking forward to connecting to anybody else who wants to reach out to us. Um, I, have a, I see our Q&As are a little short, so I have questions that I've been noting down that I have, I have interest in. Um, one of the biggest struggles for operating you know, a huge need in New York State is the amount of replacement window requests that we have. Um, people certainly uh, can be persuaded to look at a wood window rehabilitation, which is great, but we have struggled within trades programs to deal with lead abatement and working with uh, students. Any advice on a best way to approach, because certainly we don't want apprentices, students, or anybody to avoid gaining the knowledge of actually working uh, to abate lead windows? Um, I'll take at least part of this. Uh, I do want to make clear a specification between abatement and mitigation. A lot of window work is actually mitigation rather than abatement. Abatement is very full-fledged. It becomes very expensive. It becomes very expensive when you actually get into like federal buildings or public housing and the cost ends up limiting the work. You know, sometimes I have to do the price estimate. I'm like, I couldn't afford window restoration that I'm bidding out. It gets very expensive. So I think that there are definitely ways that you can do cheaper mitigations that don't end up causing long-term problems. Another big expense is undoing bad work. <laughs> so I think there are methods that we can teach homeowners, you know, don't don't do this to your window. You could do a temporary thing and it can still last for 10 years and you can save up for it. Um, and I think that any type of training for people in the window restoration business, I know there's a lot of uh, homeowner workshops, but that's always a big concern is the lead part of it. If you're training people in the window restoration, lead mitigation classes, lead RRP classes recognized by state and federal governments 
have to be a portion of it. And it is costly, but I don't think it's worth undervaluing the damage that lead poisoning can do. Um, so I think they just need to be very integrated, not only in window restoration, but in a lot of restoration, just lead safety needs to be a component of it, honestly. Anybody else like that? Oh. Laura. Yeah, I was just gonna say integrating that, those conversations I think within a training program, Northern Bedrock actually goes through a renovator certification for all of our core members because we do do a number of window restoration projects. Um, and so that's a process we go through um, in orientation to make sure that we have safety practices in place, but also that lead renovator certification is good for I believe five years. I'm gonna not, be super confident about that number, but it, it lasts long enough. So after they leave our program, they will continue to have that certification and also the um, the knowledge that to know that they can be safe and how to be safe going through that process. And so I think safety as I mentioned at one point, it's hugely for Northern Bedrock to make sure core members understand um, hazardous materials and where to find them and how to mitigate or um, abate them. All right, I'm gonna ask you maybe a controversial question for some people in the field. Um, there's lots of discussion about updating various guidance uh, briefs, the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, they've been around for a while, slight tweaks. I'm wondering what this group's perspective is on how the Secretary of the Interior standards uh, for rehabilitation are working now and how they can approve for, for a new workforce. And you am I, am I, yeah, am I going to start? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to start. <laughs> Natalie, I know you have opinions. We have opinions on this, right? <laughs> um, so look, it's, you know, the standards are the standards. Um, I, I, interpreting the standards is one thing and then just adhering to them. I think that as we move into um, different technologies, different environmental climate impacts, um, and also there's an argument I always like to pose in my SHPO <laughs> concurrence information about uh, the quality of materials available and if that really fits the bill for in kind. So there are all kinds of technologies that they didn't have 100, 200, 1,000 years ago. There's self-healing concrete. There's, um, there's a lack of lumber. There's a lack of quality hardwood lumber. And that takes generations and generations to mature. So I think that this is something that we need to really, as an industry um, and a profession, be aware of and understand the, the science and the materials and, and do these studies and support um, products, not because they back our projects, but because they really might be the best compatible uh, choice, appropriate choice for our historic fabric in the United States. So um, the standards are the standards, but I think that the treatment uh, procedures may evolve and it's something that we need to really advocate for to make this stuff sustainable, to make it so that you know my grandchildren could go to some of these sites that uh, we and I have worked on. Yeah, I, in my professional life, I very rarely reference the SOIS guidelines for how to do something. I think it comes down to your guidelines and it's become sometimes a gospel, but when you actually drill down into it, it doesn't tell you how to do a lot of stuff. I usually reference the NPS preservation briefs for that, but even those are a little tricky. You know, the, the masonry one still reckons it's a 931 with Portland cement, and that's just not, it can be right in certain contexts, but not all contexts, right? And even just trying to find something basic like best painting practices, for exterior, I had to go down a lot of rabbit holes to find this is the best methodology for these reasons. And I had to find paint science analysis tests that didn't deal with historic stuff, but just paint science in general. I would like to see a lot more studies on things that are relevant to our work to create those best practices. So you can say, yes, use this paint stripper or this paint stripping methodology on wood and doing this to get the best paint results that'll last for 30 to 50 years, dealing with lead paint, dealing with oil-based primers, dealing with lead-based primers, dealing with shellac primers. And some of that information out there, but it's very scattershot. 
I'll also add a little controversy in terms of the material science, if anybody else wants to get into it. Um, but deconstruction is not often considered part of preservation. I work in tandem. I have a shop space here in Savannah, Georgia, that is actually a salvage yard. It's a nonprofit deconstruction. They get a lot of flack for doing the decon, but otherwise the buildings get demolished. And for our business, we use a lot of that salvage material. So it's the good heart pine that we can use. We salvage tons of window sashes for that reason. It makes it cheaper for the client because we can salvage a window sash very easily for cheaply rather than having to rebuild a whole new one. So I don't know if that sparks anything for anybody. Uh, I know it can for certain people. It, it made me think of something, Natalie, uh, that I was thinking about. It's, it's not in response directly to your question, Daniel, but it's something that occurs to me that in a lot of these workforce training programs, I've, I've seen some around the country as well, but I think it's on us to consider more business training, um, entrepreneurship, uh, because if tradespeople are either going to not be interested in working in big box construction, so, so many tradespeople are small business owners like Jim Turner, who's um, present and on the chat as well too. And it seems like a path to actually being able to do a lot of preservation trades work. Um, there's always business, there's always people looking for people and they, they, they wouldn't go to a, a Grunley or a large construction place to work on their windows. But I, I think a pathway to a fulfilling life and the trades and Natalie, what you're talking about that you do through your business ownership is some of that training so that people could own their own businesses and also see the trades differently too. It's not like a Neanderthal swimming, uh, swinging a hammer. It's, you, they're business owners. They're people who get to shape their own lives. And I think including that in a lot of our training would help get more trades people in the field as well too. Um, to the point about deconstruction, that's actually been a, I love this conversation. Um, just because uh, it's a conversation I've been having with a number of people in Minnesota lately, just because so the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has actually taken this topic on and so has like started compiling different resources to talk about the benefits of deconstruction, especially from a sustainability standpoint. Um, and so I think there's a growing movement of people who really understand the benefits of deconstruction and the incorporation of it within historic preservation practice. Um, and, and to me, it also ties into conversations about sustainability, which at least for our core members has become a very critical issue to talk about on in almost every single um, field season that we do, that they're interested in, well, what's sustain sustainability, what's the environmental impact? Um, and so these conversations are also just being brought up by interested learners that we have um, in our program. Great. Hi everyone, I'm popping back up because we're um, just about at time, um, but I want to make sure if there's one last question, Daniel, or just to give you all the floor for any last bits of wisdom that you'd like to leave us with. Um, this well, I'll say this, our, our, our last question does is sort of a parting question from Amanda, who's representing the Preservation Trades Network, and, and Amanda, I'm just going to summarize it really quickly. It's, it's really asking, uh, where do you envision your organizations going in the next five years? I'm going to start with Natalie. She's at the top of the screen for me. All right. <laughs> um, I've talked with Amanda some uh, in the capacity with PTN. We want to work with them on creating that directory of tradespeople. You know, who are the subject matter experts? Uh, I'd also like to see working with them on that professionalism side. You know, if what does it mean to be a profession? Those are the people to help decide. And how do we start qualifying the people that we know are professionals? But how do we make everybody else know? You know, what is that stamp that somebody needs that they can very confidently go across the country and say, yes, I am the subject matter expert on this thing. I can teach. I can mentor. I know what I'm talking about. I can write curriculum. Um, I think a lot of what we're doing all kind of drives up to that point. Um, so I'd love to keep working with PTN in that regard. I think everybody else can talk about the educational components and how that ties in too. So Anne, th thoughts on the next five years? Um, I would like us to really just expand and, and really frame some of this uh, apprenticeship trades, um, just the history, the stories as a form of justice and as a form of reconciliation, especially for under, underrepresented groups. 
Um, I talked about a bit about their stories to be told. And that's really the meat of, of what I do is trying to find these local little things that happen that build up to bigger national movements and aesthetics and, and values that shape our country. So I, that's, I would like to do more, more types of material science because that's, you know, you guys know me, I'm a nerd, that's what I like. But also um, this, is, this is not just about saving an old, beautiful uh, colonial building. This is about giving a voice to people in, in, in our country. And I think that we all value the need for that. Laura? Uh, well, I'm just going to jump off what Anne is talking about. And, you know, kind of like I mentioned before, the conversations we're having with our core members about why they're interested and why they're participating in our program often have to do with justice issues and also have to do with seeing themselves within the built environment. Um, and so we also have a number of conversations regarding, you know, places that they find important or that they're passionate about because you know, it's difficult because sometimes you might be working on this log building that they have no connection to at all. But, you know, what we're trying to do is frame this as you're gaining skills so you can work on the places that you want to, that you can save the places that are important to your cultural context, to your identity, and to telling your story. And so I think for us, it's just teaching these hard skills isn't enough anymore. And so really connecting it to these greater contexts and the importance within our communities is something that I think younger generations and people transitioning into the field are looking for. It's, it can't be just a hard skill question. It needs to be this greater context and impact question. And so next five years, hopefully we're gonna see those connections being made more frequently and regularly. All right, so we'll conclude with, with our representative from the National Trust Hope Crew, Milan. Yes, yeah, so I'll try to be quick. I know we're at time. Um, I, I think Amanda's question, uh, it was maybe about where PTN should be in five years. I'll answer that and also where I would hope Hope Crew would be in five years. Um, what's sticking in my mind, I, I believe I saw an application come through for something with um, Jim Turner and Andrea Sabatney, and they were talking about um, an interview series, something of the sort, but it, it, it comes to mind what Anne and Laura are speaking about as well is just showcasing the other side of trades. So there's the, there's the actual hard skills training and then there's showing people the lifestyle. What, is, what would your life look like um, to help them see the, the full picture of more than just the, the bricks and mortar of what a life in the trades looks like? I think that's a great um, place for PTN to contribute. I mean, we, they're, they're the trades network of these trades people and telling the story of what your life is like as a trades person, I believe would um, resonate with some younger people who are interested in social justice and interested in other lenses. Um, for Hope Crew, I, I would hope that all of us, everyone on this call, um, all find a way to work together. Um, we, we have this trade shortage, we have these amazing programs and the shortage still exists. And I, I want us to all come together and actually make a dent in this um, to figure out how our program sequence um, to build off of each other and to, to just get everyone working together towards the cause. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. This was an incredible program. You all are doing really great work and I really appreciate the time you took today to share it with us. Um, and one of the reasons I love doing these webinars is that, you know, we focus on a specific issue like workforce development and it reminds us how intersectional preservation is because workforce development is also social justice and it's also um, sustainability and, you know, all of these other things that, that interact with it in economic development. And, and so I appreciate the larger contextualization of how this fits in the wider preservation field and why it's so important that we keep talking about it and why it's so important that you all are doing the amazing work that you're doing. So I really appreciate that. And to everyone who tuned in today, thank, thank you so much. Um, if you all have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to the league or anybody on this call. Um, and you know, the league is always doing lots of different programs. So you know, follow us on social media, look at our website and um, if there's anything that you want to see us do, you can reach out and let us know that too. Um, but Daniel, thank you so much for, for leading the conversation. And Laura Milan and Natalie, thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I hope, I hope you all come to another league program soon. And yeah, we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you all.